let's get this party started, shall we? Oh, yeah. Welcome to the refreshment. <laughs> welcome to the refreshment of the Matt Mettler podcast broadcast, everybody. I'd love to welcome you. I'm coming from the brand new Matt Mettler podcast broadcast studios here in the heart of Denver. Well, maybe not so much the heart. <laughs> More like the esophageal area of Denver. It's it's right just north of downtown and just adjacent to I-25. Uh, I'm in the new studio. I'm very excited about that. So this is the first episode, episode number seven, coming out of the studio. Very excited about that, man. It's great stuff. Let me Let me bust out my show notes. I'd like to give a shout out. I'd like to give a couple of shout outs, man. I'd like to give a shout out to my man, LB. LB! What's up, brother? How you doing, man? I hope you're doing well. I hope that my voice finds you doing well, my man. Also, I'd like to give a shout out to Tim Flanagan. What's up, Flanagan? How you doing, man? I haven't talked to you in a grip. Been a minute, man. Both you guys, I haven't talked to you in a long time, man. And then also, I'd like to welcome my new subscriber, MW, out there. Thank you for subscribing to my channel. I very much appreciate that. Um, as well as I really want to thank my great friend JJ. He gave me a call yesterday. It was the coolest thing ever. He was listening to episode two. I was talking about, you know, you should call your friends, tell them that you love them. My boy Jay called me. You know, we just had a great conversation on the phone. It was awesome. It was really cool that he did that. I was very glad to hear his voice, man. It was it was great. Um, so I just wanted to thank you guys and uh, and thank you for joining me in this episode. So uh, I got a lot to talk about, man. There's a, a whole lot of crazy stuff happened since uh, I recorded episode six, right? And honestly, I had been dying to get in and do some recording. So I came in last night and I recorded the show. And you know what? My computer, it got rid of it. It nixed it. It was like, no, nope, no, nope, that wasn't going to be the show. <laughs> and so what's really funny is uh, this gal that I hang around, man, she's very into like Gabby Bernstein. And Gabby Bernstein is very about, you know, uh, the universe is giving you clues and the universe is trying to give you help. And, you know, Gabby, is, it, she's into that sort of perspective on the whole thing. So I thought to myself, you know, what would Gabby Bernstein do? And Gabby Bernstein would say, you know, it just wasn't meant to be. So you just got to do it again. And you just got to do it again, do it better. So I guess because the universe wanted me to do this show so nice, I'm doing it twice. <laughs> so nice, I'm doing it twice. So uh, I went down to Santa Fe, New Mexico, took a little uh, road trip. That was really nice, man. I needed to get my mind off things. And that road trip was very cool, right? It was like, uh, listened to some jams, hung out, kicked back. It was great. We went down to a place called Meow Wolf. Meow Wolf is in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And it's really cool. It's an art installation. And more than that, it's kind of hard to describe because it's a story and it unfolds in a house. But that house has all kinds of weird interdimensional spaces and compartments that you get to visit and walk through and check out. And it was really neat, man. I got to say, it was really neat. And what was cool is that it, it showcased the art of many different artists. Many different artists contributed to the Meow Wolf installation. And it's very neat, man. There's some really cool different forms of art in there. There was some really cool, like, it looked like 3D art, but it, it was... It was based on the, all these really cool patterns. And uh, I don't want to spoil it too much. All I'm going to say is, you know, you should go visit Meow Wolf. It was really neat, man. It was really cool. And I would say arrive early for your time because that, the boy, that line gets pretty hella long. It moves fairly fast, but uh, get there early because it does, the line does form pretty early. That's, that's true. There's a lot of people going to Meow Wolf. It was cool though. Um, also, we went to the farmer's market down there. They had an amazing farmer's market that had uh, everything that you could possibly think of. And what was so cool is how much of the stuff they were producing locally, right? There was people that were producing, it was local honey and local uh, grass-fed pork, which I thought was very interesting. I hadn't seen that before. There was just every kind of agricultural product that you could think of, beans, everything. They had it there. It was really great. And then additionally, there was a really cool group of break dancers that were out there and they were from the local Indian school. 
And they were also, it seemed like they had a whole bunch of folks in their group. It didn't seem like it was exclusively Indian school members. It was really cool because it seemed like about, you know, 12 or 15 people out there staying out of trouble. And they were great, man. Their performance was really great. I really enjoyed it, man. They <laughs> they were super amazing because they were performing on concrete, man. No cardboard, no linoleum needed. They were just like out there windmilling on concrete. It was crazy, people. I mean, you got to be good to windmill on concrete. So, yeah, they were very, very entertaining. Threw a few bucks in their hat, man. They totally earned it. It was great. They were great entertainment. And then... Oh, let's see. We came back up out of New Mexico. And then on the way back, we did a little bit of can of tourism. And that was really cool because I learned something that I didn't really know about being a can of tourist. And I hadn't, because honestly, I hadn't really thought about it in a, quite a very long time. And that is that um, as a can of tourist, well, okay. So you forget that marijuana is a regional thing. The way that it's been implemented in Colorado is that each dispensary needs to grow a certain amount of their own product and they need to distribute a certain amount of their own product. So all of these people that are engaged in all of these places, they're all having grows operated on their behalf or they're operating grows and all of these weeds, <laughs> all, all of them tweeds that are coming out of there are different. Every place that you go you're going to get something different. So here in, in Denver, it's a little bit different, right? We got a couple of enormous players like the Green Solution, and they have a lot of places. So they grow weed for all of their stores in one place, right? It helps. Uh, it's the economies of scale, right? So they got that going for them. But down in Pueblo and stuff, you got different growers, different people growing bud. You got different strains and uh, being done differently. And it was really cool. We went to a couple of really great uh, dispensaries down there. There was one called Three Rivers. And that was really nice on the interior. What's, what's kind of mind-bending about these weed places now is how nice they are in the inside. So Three Rivers was a very nice dispensary. Another one that was really cool and very nice, uh, we went to a 719 dispensary. They were having a grand opening, and uh, they had some very friendly staff, people that were really cool, and they had great prices. I got to be honest, man. Coming out of Denver, I think maybe I'm spoiled in that respect, but they had very reasonable prices on their herbs. Their herbs looked pretty nice. They had a couple of really nice ones. And then uh, we went to this other place that was, uh, it was adjacent to this place called Obi's Barbecue on the south end of Pueblo. I don't know the name of the dispensary, but when you get something there, it will say Marisol on it. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> Because when I looked up Marisol, it popped up a different place that was not that location. But if you look up Obie's Barbecue, there's Obie's Barbecue. And then in that same building is a dispensary. And man, that's a that's a match made in heaven. Because I'm here to tell you that both of those joints ba -dum -ba -psh, are good, especially because uh, Obie's had some fabulous barbecue, man. I got a really great barbecue sandwich there. That was great. <laughs> it was great. You know, it was, uh, it was not unreasonably priced at all. It was great. So that's, uh, that's one of my notes on can of tourism. I really need everybody's help to make this succeed. I got to be honest, people. The six degrees of separation would really help me out. So when you guys like, subscribe, share, and interact with the video, even if you just leave a comment like you're a dork or you, you know, whatever, all of that helps. It sounds funny that leaving comments like that could help, but it would. So when you interact with my video, when you interact with this content, the platforms that I'm putting this on really enjoy that. So if you could leave a comment, like, subscribe, share it with your friends. That would really help me out, man. And that'll really help grow my channel. And you know, I'm a nobody. I'm an, I'm a gnat to the internet right now. I'm a hair follicle on the butt of YouTube. I want to grow this channel bigger and I need your help to do that, man. So please help me out. So briefly on my serious notes today, things I want to talk about on the serious tip I want to keep it fun. I want to keep it light, but at the same time, I want to keep it educational. I want it to be meaningful, right? Uh, so I want to talk about the battle to keep you asleep. There is a battle being waged in the world to keep you asleep, much like the matrix. You got people that are asleep. You got people that are awake, some more than others. They are battling to keep you asleep. And what I mean by that is that they want to prevent you from waking up and seeing the truth. They would really like if they could prevent you from waking up and seeing the truth. 
Also, number two mandate, keep you buying. It's really important that they keep you spending your money in their direction. And then number three is keep you running on the treadmill so that we don't look at what's really going on. And by running on the treadmill, I mean, they got to keep you ensconced in your day to day. They got to keep you distracted. And quite frankly, the lifestyle that we lead and how expensive it is in America causes you to have to, depending on where you live, you have to run faster and faster on that treadmill. So the faster you run on the treadmill, the less you are able to question the things around you. That's part of how they distract you, right? So I'm hoping to try and maybe pry your eyelid open a little bit. <laughs> I also believe that much like uh, the matrix, there are people like Cypher who wish to remain asleep or who want to go back to sleep. I don't know how you actually do that once you know the truth, but you know, there are people in the world like that, that want to go back into the matrix. You know, once you wake up people, once you wake up and see it for what it is, you don't want to go back. I don't want to go back to sleep. I know that I don't want to be a sleepwalker anymore, man. Um, I like being able to see what's going on in the world. That wraps up the battle to keep you asleep. I'm just going to say um, I got some questions for all of us in this episode. These questions are well, I would love to hear from people down in my comments section about these questions and what you guys think. And the first question that I have is the reason that I posit this question to all of you is that I don't have kids that I know of. As a result of that, I want to ask the following question to you. Do your children belong to you or do they belong to the government? My next question, since we're heading into 2020 and we're, we're ramping up into 2020, unfortunately, we're now almost near that season. I want to ask the question, what buys your vote? What will buy your vote? What is the key issue for you this year? I'd be curious to just hear what people have to say about that because one of the things that I'm trying to do is listen to other people and see what they say. So I'd be really curious to hear you guys' impressions on that one. And then my next question is, does the government exist to serve us or do we exist to serve it? It's an interesting question. I would argue that the government exists to serve us. We do not exist to serve it. We can exist without the government. The government cannot exist without the people. That's what I would say about that. So does the government exist to serve us or do we exist to serve it? The reason that I ask you that is it shapes your perspective on what you feel the role of the government is. For really, I feel like it should be helping, not hindering. And I feel like it's inefficient, but I'll leave that for an entire another time. And then my next thing is a little thought exercise. And the thought exercise is the government as a game of chess. And initially I thought about, you know, the government is a game of chess, meaning that you have two sides that are opposing each other. And by that, I mean, you got the left and the right in America, they're opposing each other and they're playing this game. And over time, attrition takes pieces out of either side, right? And at some point, one side or the other wins the game. The game it will come to a point where it's concluded. There will be no further moves available. But then I got to thinking about the fact that that wasn't actually an accurate description of what was going on. I actually stopped to think about what would be a more accurate look at how government works would be the game of Chinese checkers. Chinese checkers has six different players on the board and they all play against each other. And that actually, I thought, was a much more analogous way to look at government and playing the game because you don't actually have just two factions. You have like six. Some of them work together. Some of them don't. Some of them kind of groove. Some of them don't. You know, and then, then some of them are completely opposed to each other. So I was like, Chinese checkers is actually a more accurate description. And, and then I got to thinking about the fact that I now realize that Chinese checkers was a strategy game about partnering with the people that you were friends with to win the board, <laughs> right? And then maybe at the end, battling against your friends for the final parts of the board. Leave it to the Chinese to come up with something brilliant like that. And then my final question for this particular segment is does the caste system exist here in America? 
And by caste system, I'm talking about like over in India, you have the caste system. You have people that are in the upper class. They're doing really great, man. They're the ends as Eddie Murphy would say, the ends are meeting like, you know, it's like they're, they're doing just fine. And then you got a, a burgeoning middle class that's actually kind of up and coming and developing. And you have a part of India that's actually very modern and very developed. And then you got a, a subclass underneath that that is sort of like the struggling, really want to move into that crust up above them class. And then you got the like the really low end folks that are in that caste, right? And and once you've been placed into a caste in India, it's very difficult to move out of that caste unless the mobility is downward. The question I have is, do we have a caste system here in America? I don't want to believe that we do, but when I examine the evidence, I think we kind of do. When I look at the homelessness problem and how that's kind of not being handled or addressed in a way that's really satisfactory, it bugs me. It bothers me. I ask that question of you guys. Does the caste system exist here in America? I kind of think it does. My next segment is, I want to call this part, don't believe the hype. Don't believe the hype, people. So, like I said earlier, we are now running up into uh, into 2020, and the propaganda machine is firing up into high gear. So it is out there, and you have an entire industry whose mission is to control what you see, hear, and think. I invite you to recognize that the mainstream media is the boy who cried wolf, and that we shouldn't believe them outright. They don't have your interests in their minds. They have theirs. So what we need to do is make them earn back their position as a trusted news outlet. I think that they have abused the privilege for far too long. And it is time for us to sort of reclaim that territory. And one of the things that I love about citizen journalism is that it is like, well, if you guys won't tell us the truth, we'll just go back to doing it ourselves. And now that there is a methodology for that to work, it's really biting into their model and they don't like that. So here's some things that I would like to see come out of the lamestream news media. And not that I really care. What I'd really like to see is for them to collapse and die under their own weight. But what I'd like to see is that they should tone down their bias. They should tone all of these news outlets that claim to be news need to tone down their bias. Your bias is showing. So, you know, it's like, it's very hard to take any given source seriously when they are so biased in one direction because everything is approached through that biased lens. The next one is that they should stop using the news as an emotional crowbar because that's exactly what they're doing, right? They pry on you, they pry on your emotions and they pry on your wallet with the news, man. And I'm just tired of it. I really wish that we could get back to doing something different on that tip. No doubt about it, right? I think that they should go back to reporting the news in a more fact-based way that doesn't attempt to lead viewers to presupposed conclusions, right? Once upon a time, the news' job was not to actually make you form a conclusion. It was just to kind of show you what happened and let you decide. I fear that we've now reached a point where they're like, no, y- y'all are too dumb. We must decide for you. We, we must make you come to a conclusion that we want for the outcome that we want. Nah, I don't like that. One of the things that we really should stop and recognize is that far greater than Russia as an influencer And I'm not trying to say that Russia is not an influencer. They are. They engage in all kinds of interesting tactics and techniques. And to understand more about that, watch this Russian film called Generation P. It's an amazing film about how they use propaganda. And it will open your eyes. And and you'll be like, hmm, are they doing some of that in America? Quite possibly. You know, so I don't want to say that they don't have any influence, but what I want to say is that recognize for what it is that far greater than Russia, a thousand times, 10,000 times, a million times more powerful than Russia is Google, Twitter, and Facebook. They are the influencers. What they're suppressing and what they're boosting dramatically influences the outcomes of elections. So before we point the finger at Russia, let's look at Google. Let's look at Facebook, right? Just this morning, there's news out there about they're doing an antitrust investigation into Google and Facebook. I think that's great. I think that's great because 
I think they've come to a place where they're too overwhelmed with trying to police everything. And my feeling on it is they shouldn't have to. They shouldn't have to police everything. We could do things like ratings and rankings and stuff like that where the people decide, you know, do you want to see it? Do you not want to see it? We could even have a thing right there where you click on it and say, man, I, I would advise you not to watch this. And you could make your judgment based on that. We don't have to deny the platform of free speech to all people because some people say things that other people don't like. And that is problematic, man, because once we get to a world where you can only say certain things, it's all downhill from there. It's all downhill from there. I trust voices like Tim from Timcast, the Timcast channel on YouTube, to be far more honest and less biased than I would mainstream news media that leans left. And that should really say something, you know, because although he's a journalist and I'm going to legitimately call him a journalist, he used to work for Vice. He does what looks to me like journalism. He does it on a routine basis. And although he routinely states that he comes from a center left position, I at least think he talks sense. I at least think that he reports the news in a way that is far less biased than other sources. And he's willing to have a conversation about it, right? I think that's the kind of people that, that I think I could meet in the middle with as far as being able to have a talk or a conversation about where we are now and how we might actually fix some of these problems. Because that's one of the things that is very troubling, right? Problematic is that we got a lot of problems that they haven't really fixed them. And if anything, they've just kind of expanded and gotten worse over time. And it's like, what do you guys propose to do to fix this stuff? You know, I'm just curious. All right. So I wanted to say something as we head into 2020, I wanted to say the following. Why do we listen to politicians that come from areas that aren't successful and look to them like they're problem solvers. If they can't fix anything locally, then they certainly can't fix anything at a national level. We need to remember that and look where the people are coming from. In my opinion, we should reject, or at a minimum, very seriously scrutinize any candidates from California, Illinois, Michigan, New York, for being outright unsuitable. They come from struggling areas that have been decimated by their management policies and their choices. Why would we want those people in charge of our country? I want everybody to think about that for a minute, right? Do not listen to people that come from train wrecks of cities. Do not listen to people that come from train wrecks of states. California, Illinois, Michigan, New York, they're all a complete train wreck. When it comes to regulations being overburdensome, when it comes to the taxes being overly high, when it comes to being anti-business, when it comes to being all of those things, why would we want those people to be in charge of the country? They're going to bring those completely failed ideas and those completely failed policies, and they're going to implement them, and it's not going to work. They're going to make it just like the places that they came from because that's all they really know how to do. So we got to do better in this one, people. When it, when it happens this time around, we got to do better. My next topic, just briefly, is that I want to talk about fighting censorship by big tech. You know, there's a whole lot of people in the internet that are now not really allowed to say what they want to say. And I think that's lame. I think that even if you say stuff I don't like, you should still be allowed to say it. You know why? Because I live in the, the country of America and we have this thing called the First Amendment and that gives you the right to say things that I don't like. And there's a lot of people in the world that say things that I don't like, but you have the right to do it. And I respect that, right? I don't have to agree with the stuff that you say. I usually think that when you flap your lips, you outline yourself as an idiot. So I, I'm all for letting people talk. <laughs> I don't remember who said it, but it's better to keep your mouth closed and let them think you an idiot than open it and prove them right. It's an interesting thing that has come out of the internet is the cry bully. We now actually have, we now exist in the world of the cry bully. The cry, I never even thought that this could exist in America, but man, believe it does. The cry bully idea is where you could have a, a million likes on a video. But if one person is offended, if, one, if just one person is offended, we have to act on that. We have, to, we have to make sure that that one person's rights are upheld. And it's like, right to what? Not be offended? 
Believe it or not, that's not outlined anywhere in the Bill of Rights. The right to be offended actually was, you know, I'm pretty sure the Founding Fathers, when they kicked this shit off, they knew that there was going to be plenty of people offended. They knew that that was going to happen all the time. There was people offended when the government was founded, man. So be real about that. So we now live in an era of a cry bully. They will try and leverage their power to control what people are allowed to say and control what people are allowed to talk about. And I just think that it's beyond lame. It's beyond lame. And we need to, to be more resistant to all of that. I think that we should diversify our methods of communication and go outside of YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. Finding other places where, and, and I was thinking about this in the, in the respect that not do it all the time. Just do it once in a while as an idea, you know, just dabble with it uh, once in a while as an idea to just sort of see what it would be like, right? I think that there could be value in that because then as it gets progressively worse, it'll be easier to move away from these platforms because I don't think that it's going to get any better. I think that it'll just get worse. Oh, my next segment, I want to talk about when we get really big stuff completely wrong. Yeah. That happens. So a couple of examples that I would like to use for this is that sometimes humanity and science and religion and humanity (laughs) our imaginations get the best of us. And sometimes we do stupid stuff. And here are my examples. So in 1999, there was this thing called the millennium bug. It was also known as Y2K, right? We were all very worried that at uh, midnight on 1999 into 2000, that there was going to be this, um, this bug that was going to cause all kinds of computers to crash. And it was going to cause all kinds of infrastructure to crash and that it was going to cause all kinds of chaos. And I would dare to say that it probably stunted a lot of money that evening because a lot of people probably didn't go out. I know I didn't go out. And when midnight came, nothing happened. Absolutely nothing of any consequence took place, right? I believe that maybe in the news the next day or whatever, there might have been a couple of software programs that were affected by it. But beyond that, it didn't have any of the impact that they thought it would. Another one that I just thought of actually was the Ebola outbreak a while back in Africa. So yes, I understand they're, they're dealing with Ebola, but they tried to make it sound like it was this enormous threat. They really played up the fear component of Ebola and we fell for that, right? But it never materialized. We did not have an Ebola outbreak here. We had a couple of people that were affected, but we didn't have any kind of outbreak here. That was not at all. And I kind of feel like we don't, we exist in a world that's different than it was back in the 1800s or whatever. It's like the CDC and stuff, they're not going to let an outbreak take place in America. They'll just put them all in a tent, dude. All right. Another one that we got completely wrong. 2012. I was just watching a documentary on YouTube about this place in the middle of BFE (laughs) And it was filmed prior to 2012. And in that, there's a lot of talk from the people about the ramp up to 2012 and how there was all this uncertainty about, you know, the end of the Mayan calendar. And I remember that. That was kind of a big deal. I think at that point, maybe around that time, I'd sort of just put together like a home survival kit just as a sort of in case stuff happens uh, sort of thing, right? And then I remember 2012 came and went and nothing happened happened. Nothing happened. So, I mean, I know I come off as skeptical and I am skeptical and I'm not trying to let my confirmation bias get the best of me, but I'm just trying to be realistic in a way. I think I want to point out our hubris and our arrogance in saying that we know everything, you know, because clearly these three events that didn't happen. These three non-events that didn't happen that were predicted to happen. Clearly we don't know everything. It's just a fact. So I thought that was really good uh, gum to chew on mentally that sometimes we get shit completely wrong. People, sometimes we get stuff completely wrong. Briefly, I wanted to talk about, so John Stossel has a great video. He has many actually. But one of them is called Exposing Kids to Capitalism. 
And in that video, he talks about the unintended consequences of government intervention into problems. And some of the unintended consequences of government intervention that, that he outlined were, uh, it usually starts out with good intentions. It usually starts out with the best of intentions, right? But then it tends to make the things that are associated to it less efficient. And then it ends up not providing the intended outcomes. And then it sort of, it expands the problem, makes it worse, and it creates weird side effects that we couldn't have anticipated. And then at the end of that, it creates fraud, waste, and abuse. And then that just sort of continues in perpetuity because the government is very good about instituting things and then never fixing them or never repairing them. Yeah, I mean, we have that cycle associated with the unintended consequences of government intervention. And he makes the case that there are some things in the world that we, that we, the people, just people, should handle amongst ourselves. And that's true. There are things that we should ask the government to not weigh in on. There are things that we should ask them to stay out of because they're not that great at it. And once you codify it and once you give them the authority, a lot of times you get really unintended consequences. And I just thought that that was a very, it was such a good observation. I thought it was very cool that he was showing these kids that we implemented all kinds of programs that we thought were going to fix and solve problems. But over time, they actually made the problems worse. They created unintended consequences that we did not anticipate. And now those big bloated, worthless systems have people trapped in a cycle of poverty and they cannot escape it. If the intent was to erase poverty, it seems to me what the intent was is to institutionalize poverty because that's kind of what it's done. Yeah, I think it's really great that he's got videos out there where he's showing kids about what capitalism can do. And I'll always argue that capitalism is the cleanest dirty shirt in the hamper, right? America and capitalism is the cleanest dirty shirt in the hamper, people. A lot of people, they make a lot of judgments about America, but they haven't been to other places. I've been to Spain, Belgium, England, France, Germany, the Netherlands. You know, I've been to a lot of places and I'm here to tell you that we're doing okay in America. We got it pretty good in America. If you don't know that, maybe you need to do a little bit of traveling. <laughs> maybe you need to become a little more worldly and go out into the world and you will recognize, wow, for all of its faults, America's still pretty good. Like I said, we're still the cleanest, dirty shirt in the hamper, man. The takeaways from the unintended consequences are that some things are better left to the people to deal with. And because when you ask the government to do it, you are technically seeking the arbiter of last resort first. Our founding fathers would have said that you don't want the government weighing in on your problems. They would have said, if you can possibly solve between the two of you, do it that way first. Only get the government involved if that's just not possible. And I think that's great advice. We should always try and solve problems with each other first. You know, it, if a lot of times if we just have some conversation and we learn to know who the other person is and we get to respect each other and we press palms, an agreement can be reached. I guess maybe I'll leave you with that, people. I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining me for the seventh episode of the podcast. I'm very proud of that because my original podcast only went nine episodes and it never got any farther than that. It took like two years to get nine episodes. I'm on episode number seven. This is I've been doing this for 33 days. So I'm very stoked about making this thing successful and I need your help, people. So please, again, like, subscribe, share, and uh, please join me for the next episode of the Matt Mettler podcast. The Matt Mettler podcast is a Matt Mettler production. Copyright 2019.